want to do is if you have ambition to be great, my job is to coach you to get all that greatness out of you. What's good, Finn Nation? What's good? It's your boy Reason, and we are back here for another one. I hope everyone is having a fantastic, fantastic start to the week. I hope everyone had a fantastic 4th of July. <clears throat> I know I said I would be back on um, on uh, Sunday, but I actually ended up forgetting that uh, you know I had committed to go see Top Gun with the wife. So that's why you actually didn't catch me on Sunday. And that's why I didn't want to go live yesterday because I know all y'all had your things going on. So I wanted to let all my American friends celebrate. I hope all y'all grilled up some good some good eats. But I'm going to tell you one thing for sure. I'm going to tell you one thing for sure. Go see Top Gun if you haven't had a chance to catch it yet. So Hammer's out here saying his hand looks, it looks like Jason Pierre Paul's right now. He's saying he's... Blew off some fingers. My guy, you need to relax. Back up, Terry. Back up. Back up. What's good, everyone? Um, I see Ray's here. Zim Zim, Hammer, obviously, James Steele, Jeff, Corey, um, Friendly, Cruz, Topher. What's going on, everyone? Um, young, F young F, young in FM Miami. What's going on? Todd, um, Duke, Jason, um, Nicholas, Tilly. What's going on, Tilly? How you doing? The homie Tilly out here. Uh, Larry, what's going on, buddy? Um, God. God watches me. What's going on? Diesel, what's going on? Uh, where's Razor at? That Dolphin Realtor. I'm guessing you're... That Dolphin Realtor, I'm guessing, is the man who who... You got to follow purely off PR look, my friend. <laughs> Chef Jew. Um, homie Austin, what's good, buddy? Scotty. Um, I'm trying to go back up here. Marino's goat. Um, Joseph. I'm up, I'm up, I'm up. Man, a lot of you are already here. MG Taxman, JJ. Shout out to James Steele for becoming a new member. Appreciate that. Shout out to Nicholas Marks for becoming a new member. I appreciate that as well. What up, Mike? Atania, uh, Steve O, um, Omar. Omar is always one of the first here. What's going on, Omar? How you doing, bro? Angel, Usmem. How you doing, bro? Florida Bigfoot, um, King Z three hundred five. Stetson says he's going to be in Toronto in eight days. What are you doing out in Toronto? Stetson, Dennis, what's going on? The Dolphin Realtor's laughing because I nailed it. He is that guy. Bull Mastiff, Andy, I have a dog. Shout out to the Bull Mastiff. I have a dog in the chat right now. Taryn Langover, what's going on? Danny Taylor, Michael. What's going on, everyone? Polly King, 305. Polly King 305, are you the yo Polly King? Are you the dude on Twitter that everyone thinks you're like my burner account or something? There, I think I'm pretty sure it's you, Fred. What's going on, Evan? Um, band, uh, Jay Shizzy, yo, Polly King, if you're here, are you the dude that everyone thinks is my burner account or some shit? Uh, X Man, what's going on? I'm pretty sure it's you, Brandon. Um, I'm pretty sure it's you, lol. Uh, Richard, I'm trying to get everyone. Marcus, Stetsono, Zim Zim, Tony Osawa, Polly King, DC3. Okay, so Polly King, you responded. Hold on a sec. Aren't you? I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's you. I'm pretty sure it's you. Hold on a sec. Yeah, 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 it's you. Aren't you the one who gets into he get in like arguments with people and stuff? You like you get into arguments with the trolls. No, I'm pretty sure it's you, my dude. I'm pretty sure it's you. I'm not hating. I mean, whatever, bro. Aren't I'm pretty sure you've gotten into it with a, a, some of these fools out here. Me, I'm pretty sure it's you. And they thought you were like my uh 
my my burner account or something like that. Oh, let me see. Give me one sec. I'm I'm gonna tell you right now. Well, maybe it isn't you, but there's someone who has a similar name to you. The whole Polynesian thing, and they think it's like my burner burner account. I kind of swore it was you. Uh, it was it's, but it's someone very similar name to you that got into it with people out there. Uh, shout out to Evan, like defending me and like defending um some of us against trolls and stuff. And they think like you're my burner. I don't know. It's someone. It's someone similar to you. I just looked. It's not you, Evan. What's going on? Um, B Hardinger, what's going on? Thank you, Evan and B Hardinger, for becoming um channel members. Yeah, people actually think I have time out here and give a crap enough about them to create burner accounts and stock them. It's ridiculous. Uh, K Jax, when they're the ones that are actually creating all the burner accounts, EO, uh, Danny Taylor, Chris, what's going on? Um, Randy, what's going on? So, yeah, we got a bunch to come up today, man. I'm, I'm gonna tell you this right now, I am hyped. For this Jalen Waddle, um, Tyreek Hill episode coming out, that's actually gonna be um, that episode's gonna be coming on Friday. So I'll be going live Friday. Um, you know, after the episode drops, it's dropping around seven seven thirty. I'll be live around eight, and uh, we'll rock through that episode. I can't wait. We got a little preview here. I want to sing, and it's the title of the video. But I got actually a bunch of Jalen Waddle stuff to go over today. Um, that we're going to dive into a little bit. You know, we've been looking in breakout players lately. Um, I also want to take a look at uh, CBS listing the best wide receiver duos. Pro Football Talk continues to have the worst rumors ever and are stirring the proverbial pot. I'll talk about it, even though I think it's bullshit. Um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to take a look and ask you guys a question. Is Mike McDaniel the biggest winner of the offseason for the Miami Dolphins? I got a list of... Things casual fans might say, um, and then a trade idea for you. And also, I, I I'd been meaning to get to it on the last show, but I just slipped my mind. I got a little excerpt I want to pay as RG three continues to pay a lot of respect um, to Tua Tagovailoa and what he sees is going to happen this year. So I wanted to play that for you for you guys as well. So we got a lot of stuff to go over um, tomorrow. I'm going to be live. And what, what's going to happen is tomorrow we're going to take a look at um, um, the five um, biggest position battles heading into um, training camp. All right. I want to take a look at that. And then I got another theme show I want to do the day after that. So tomorrow we're going to take a look at um, – and then, you know, guys, it's right around the corner. We are 14 days away, I believe – from the rookies reporting, I believe they report on the 19th. So um, we're going to preview the offense. We're going to preview the defense. We're going to preview special teams before we get there. Um, the Tyreek video. Um, I'm actually going to get to working on it tonight. I've been, I, I was just super busy this weekend and ended up not getting much done on it, but we're going to be taking a look at Tyreek and what he brings to this offense. Um, basically I'm going to take 10 plays and, um, you know, it's going to be stuff that are going to not only be run in our offense, but it's also going to be, I'm going to show you how he makes um, it easier for the quarterback. I'm going to show you basically how he keeps the defense honest. And I'm going to show you guys examples of the space he's going to create based off the attention he's going to draw for other receivers. So, we're going to take I haven't even like watched the Kurt Warner breakdown on Tyreek Hill just because I, I've been trying not to get, you know, how I want to do this video skewed. That's my intention of doing this video. And that's been my intention day one. Those are the things I'm going to look at. So I'm, I'm, I'm planning on looking at about 10 plays. Now I say that it might turn into 15 um, because it's not only I'm only going to be looking at passing. I'm going to be looking at what he brings as a rusher to this offense too, because you know, that's going to be a, um, something he's going to be asked to do. It's going to, multiple guys are going to be, I think Eric is going to be asked to do that. I think Jalen Wall is going to be asked to do that, but I think Tyreek going to be asked to do it. And uh, there's a good reason why Tyreek is going to be asked to do it. Right. I mean, you talk about people with 75 plus carries in the NFL. Tyreek Hill is number one, averaging 7.7 .7 yards. He averaged more than what Jerry Rice did when they gave him the ball out of the backfield. Like Tyreek is special. So, 
we're going to get into all that kind of stuff. So we're going to break him down. Um, and then I, I, I might push the Mike McDaniel offensive film study to the top right behind him and then try to get to Kellen Deesh and try to get to Jalen Waddle's rookie season um, because we're running out of time before training camp happens because once training camp happens, it's going to be plethora of, of information. So, um, But those are, those are the plans I'm going with right now, all right? So a lot of content coming in. Um, we are also about 150 away from 8,500. We are 6,500 away from 9,000. We are 1,650 away from 10,000. So that said, if you are new, please smash that like button. Subscribe if you are new. Appreciate that. You can save 15% off picks at Pick 6 Apparel by using code FINS at the NFL at Pick6Apparel.com. You guys see me drink out of the mugs. I don't have one around me all the time. They got great stuff. They do mugs. They do coasters, everything. Go check them out. The greatest thing about them is how fast they deliver. So it's uh, all the way from England, and that stuff is here in like three business days. So go check them out, 15% off. Go support the channel. Go show some love. All right, guys? Um, I did want to talk about something quickly before we get into everything. And Michael kind of set me off here. Not set me off like mad, but, you know, he, he's saying something that is something I kind of want to talk to here and why. So Michael says, reason this is the, this Dolphin team might be our best team since 1984. I, I want to talk about this here for a sec. You know, I talked about it last season and it ended up being realer than I could have imagined. So let's talk about it right now. Expectations. And we're going to talk about, um, you know, we're going to talk about Mike McDaniel here in a sec. And we're going to talk about, um, you know, well, not a sec, but soon. We're going to talk about Mike McDaniel and, you know, and just the offseason the Dolphins had and how it benefits him. And the expectations, you know, I want people to realize how much the expectations are real right now. Um, last year, you know, I said expectations are so real that watch if we don't live up to them, fans are going to turn on Brian Flores and boom. And what happened right now? I was already starting to look at them sideways based off things I was hearing last summer. Right. And I was conveying, I was being honest with you guys the whole time. You know, I wasn't not telling you guys what was happening. And um, so anyways, um, you know, the expectations are so real right now. And we have so we, you know, we expect so much from what, what we put together that a lot of people are, are forgetting. And me at times too, I'm guilty of this, that we're, we're going through with it. What we're going to do is we're going to go through what, whatever we're going to go through this year. It's going to be with a first time head coach. And, you know, everyone expects that leap to a, you got to take that leap. Um, you know, Tua got to take that leap. Everyone expects it. Everyone wants it. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's kind of crazy to me. Um, you know, when I hear fans talk about Super Bowl run or AFC championship now, do I believe this team can win a playoff game? 110%. But even that, you got to remember, guys. If this team makes the playoffs and wins a playoff game, do you know what kind of accomplishment that is for a first-time head coach? And I know we got the pieces in place, but think of it. There's still stuff that has to be fixed here. It's not like he's walking in, taking this over, and everything is just lined up for him, right? He's basically got to, I don't want to say the word refurbish, but in a way, he does have to refurbish this offensive line, right? He's got to refurbish talent that's on there and in a new system. And, you know, I, uh, you know, the expectations are real when you hear everyone saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But no one mentions that we have a first year head coach. That's what really rings true to me that everyone expects greatness is here because. No one's talking about a first-time head coach. Everyone's talking about Tua more, right? Or everyone's talking about Tyreek taking a step back more, right? No one's even taking talking about our defense potentially taking a step back with Flores gone. No one's talking about the head coach, 
Well, I mean, you know, sure there are. I'm talking about generally, okay? I'm sure there's people out there that are. I'm talking about generally, all right? And it just it, it just rings true of how real these expectations are. And it's not a matter of, oh, here we go again. But it's a matter of, it, it makes you wonder what happened, what's going to happen if the expectations aren't going to li be lived up to. Like, do I think Mike Mandan is going to get fired? No, I don't. That'll be a bad message to send through the NFL. Um, obviously, if Tua doesn't live up to it on his on his end, he'll probably go on. But like, what if the defense takes a step back? Now Josh Boyer goes. Do we go make that run after Vic Fangio? You know, does he go bring in people he knows throughout the league that he's confident can run a three four defense, or do we gotta retool and rework the defense because it's already so set that that would set us back years? You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's just when no one's talking that you have a first year head coach and everyone's talking about the weapons and the talent on this team, that tells you the expectations. Like, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. Staley, the coach at, uh, at the Chargers, okay? Was everyone really expecting them to make the playoffs last year? And that was a damn good roster. But was anyone expecting them to make the playoffs last year? Like, generally. Like, now I know, hey, hey, this year I know we're seeing them in a lot of top 10 roster lists, and we're seeing them high in a lot of preseason power rankings. But no one was really out here. It just feels like they have higher expectations for this Dolphins roster than what that Chargers roster last year was. And that Chargers roster last year was no freaking joke. Right? Like, obviously, the Bengals caught everyone off by guard because off guard because no one had expectations that they were going to go run the gauntlet to the Super Bowl. And it's crazy. Uh, Steve-O says, yes, because of Herbert. But really, I never heard about it. He won Rookie of the Year, and there was no talk about, okay, I, I never got... You know, like when they didn't make the playoffs, you never got the sense of all oh, expectations weren't lived up to, right? Because remember, as a rookie, when he was throwing 40, 50, 60 times a game, and I'm not even exaggerating with the 60, they had a losing record, right? So they were just wanted to turn that around and get a winning record. And anything more than that was a bonus. We've had a winning record back to back years. So that's why the expectations are higher than what they were for last year with Herbert. Now, the expectations are real for Herbert this year. Don't get me wrong. But my whole point is they had a better roster than us last year offensively. Defensively, they were good, but they weren't as good as us. Now they had Derwin and such, but obviously they weren't us. But they had a good defensive roster. No doubt about it. They had a solid defensive roster, but their offense was really good. They had a more complete rounded out roster. Let's call it that way, right? With a guy coming off winning, you know, rookie of the year. Now he blew it against Vegas in overtime and anyone who was watching that game saw they were going to tie and they were going to lose. You just could see that coming from a mile away. But my whole point is here. Staley was a first-year head coach last year. He adopted a really well-rounded-out roster that they added to with Rashawn Slater and such through the draft and free agency. They got that offensive line better. And still, the expectations were nowhere near as high for the Chargers as what they are for the Dolphins. But no one's talking about McDaniel as a first-year head coach. Everyone just, it, it's kind of like a Madden feel. It's kind of a Madden feel in the sense of, oh, he's just going to slide in there and everything's going to be the same. So, man, kind of interesting. Kind of interesting when you when you think about it, that everyone seems to have short-term amnesia, that McDaniel's a first-year head coach, and instead everyone wants to talk about Tyreek or they want to talk about how Boyer's going to run the defense or they want to talk about the offensive line or they want to talk about Tua. But not a lot of people are honing in of, hey, 
this team could go through lumps and in and in, in, in a period of adaption due to a first time head coach, you know, navigating his way through the seas of an NFL season. So really interesting stuff, man. When, when you sit back and think about, it, because it just tells you how real the expectations are, man. The expectations are that this new coach is going to come in and he's just going to hit the ground running. And even I, you know, even I'm victim to that. I'll be the first to admit that. So, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see how how it all plays out with McDaniel and this year. Like, I, I honestly think this is a, you know, this is a, this is an 11, a minimum should be an 11 win team here. But it's going to be, it's going to be down to what, man, we need so many things to align. Think about it. We need. Offensive linemen like Austin Jackson and Eichenberg, who haven't really given us anything to write home about at the pro level, to all of a sudden give us something to write home about. We need Connor Williams to transition to center smoothly. We need Mozart and Chase Edmonds to stay healthy. Same can go for Sony Michelle as well. We need Tua to take a leap. We need a first time head coach to basically minimize the learning curve he's going to go through and show that he's that dude when the when the bullets are flying we need boyer to show that he can survive on his own as a defensive coordinator with no flores safety net we need a lot going on here we need a lot going on here. Uh, you still attending training camp this year? I'm going to try. The problem is um, my wife got promoted to a uh, really new, really high position. So taking time off right now um, is a big, uh, you know, it's not something she wants to do. So uh, that that's where I'm at right now. Appreciate you, TLC. Don't go chasing waterfalls, my friend. Roam out here, spitting facts. Uh, Steve-O, what is more important, Dieter winning back center or Connor flourish at center? Dieter winning back center. So Connor Williams can go back to left guard and we can have the best left side in football. Like, that's what's so frustrating. We should have the best left side in football right now. I'm sorry. Connor Williams and Taron Armstead, when healthy, will be freaking unstoppable. Stoppable and dominant in the run will be Connor Williams leaning on Taron Armstead in the passing game too. Dominance. Dominance. And all because you couldn't get center short up. And really, all you would have had to do was not trade up for Eichenberg and let Creed Humphrey fall in your lap last year. But they wanted to play games. And here we are. Don't know what else to say, but Dieter, Dieter needs to hit. Dieter needs to hit more, no more than Eichenberg because we still got a chance at Jackson hitting at right tackle. Listen, if you can get the center to hit, think about this: if you get the center to hit, your left tackle's a hit, your left guard's a hit, your center's a hit, your right guard's a hit. Now you're just waiting for right tackle to. And here's the thing: you can send help. Right, you got Engel coming out of the backfield. You got our running backs coming out of the backfield. Zone outside scheme. You're going to be pulling in unison anyway, so you're going to be moving in unison and blocking in unison, so he can get help. Taron Armstead allows you to leave himself on an island, so you can shift help that protection down and shift help down and help him out. So if you only got once, it's it's a lot easier. The Richmond Web. I always have this conversation with Richmond Web. You know, Richmond Web tells me, listen problem with the offensive line right now is you don't know whether it's coming the a gap the b gap off the edge you don't know but if you can limit it to at least just one spot even if it is the blind side you have an extra set of eyes in your head and you can send protection that way because you know 99 percent of the time that's where the leak's going to come for from so with a guy who already has an elite pocket sense like tua if he knows the only he has he showed us elite pocket sense and he's had to worry about everywhere except for right guard really 
with, with Robert Hunt. So it, imagine what he'll do if he knows he only has to worry about one place. He will shut it down. He will shut it down. So, you know, and I will say this. I think Austin Jackson will look better next with with Robert Hunt next to him as well. You saw how good Austin Jackson looked in year one before that ankle injury when Solomon McKinley also before the ankle injury was playing at his best as a pro. They were moving bodies in the run game. They were working really, really well. So Austin Jackson, if he has a good guard next to him, like a really good dependable guard like Robert Hunt, that can help him, I think he'll be fine. You know what I mean? I, like if you can get Austin Jackson to that play of the of the first six games of that year one, that's competent enough for us to make it, make a push here. Right? Like, we've got the franchise tackle. Now the other tackle just needs to be competent. That's all. It's not like we're asking for this guy to become, you know, a Tristan Wirfs. What's up with Solomon Kinley? I mean, he had the ankle injury, and now he's got weight issues, and he hasn't been able to get his body weight down. Right? I mean, you're already slow pulling and you add on more weight, it's only going to make you even slower, which is shocking because he's such a good, because he loves swimming and such. You know what I mean? The guy's out here as a frolicker. And yet, it, you know, he's got to slim down. Saul McKinley has got to slim down massively. Way too big. He's shown bad discipline when he's not around the building. That's what Saul McKinley's problem is. And then he got put in the doghouse because of it. Scotty, no, Kinley's not working out. Form don't really work with offensive linemen. They only work with offensive linemen when the quarterback or the running backs or whatever bring them. One of the uh, Form's newest clients, though, was Jared Judy. So, Solomon Kinley, you know, he just doesn't have the discipline right now to be a pro. Sad, though, because he showed a lot of promise in year one. Man, you go look at my early uh, man. I remember one of his first reps when he took out uh, what's his face, Ed Oliver. That man put Ed Oliver on his ass. You go back and watch. It's like the second rep. It's like the second or third rep in that Bills game of uh, the twenty twenty season, and he puts Ed Oliver on his ass, just blows him up. But he's purely a power gap guy, unless he loses a bunch of weight going to need to lose a bunch of weight to fit what we want to do. So, um, but the potential's there, you know, and the problem is because of the whole doghouse thing and because of our coaching staff, we haven't even developed him into a, well, okay, you're not going to lose the weight. Well, you're good enough where we can trade you to a power gap scheme team for like a mid round pick. We haven't even done that much justification to the draft pick. So, see, poor coaching doesn't just hurt you with on-field product. It can hurt you with also when you want to, uh, you know, acquire um, assets for assets. If you're not going to develop them properly. You're not going to get a proper return. All right, that said, let's get into this. Let's start it off. I'm going to play this preview clip. It is from this Friday's episode coming up of uh cheetah's podcast that the homie jill and waddle is going to be on and we're going to be live on friday after the episode airs hopefully it airs on time all right check what jill and waddle had to say control people wait <laughs> me and jay Dell gonna create wait. create twitter fake twitter accounts it'd be so much i'll be one to say right all right how do you how do y'all deal with that? Like how do you deal with that? Like you see it, I think it's y'all at practice, but you don't want to speak on it like you said. It, it, it remains to be seen. Y'all's gonna let y'all 
uh, on the field play show. Bro, it's just like a horror movie, bro. It's just like suspense, bro. You gotta you gotta get that build up, you know. Just like all of the clips they've been releasing and stuff like that. You just can't show it all, right? You know? right. Like that's why I really believe they like showed that clip of Tua under throwing me, you know, mm-hmm. just to get people talking because they really know what Tua capable of for real. Like there's a plan yeah. behind everything, bro. Right. That's the way I look Ooh. at it. I don't know. What's your name, Jalen? They got a plan. They're trying to bury the man. I ain't going to lie. That boy looks scared right now. He's scared. Woo! He's scared right now. Oh, wait, look, answer this. And you ain't got to give us everything. To a last year, going into this year, how does he look? I'm not going to sugarcoat. What's it called it, bro? That's been, it's been him. Like, he been that guy since. Alabama. Since it. Since Alabama, like he's been that guy. He's been the same guy. He's gonna come in consistent, accurate. He's gonna make the throws he's supposed to throw. And he's gonna show out, be a great leader. He's gonna be all that. Like, so it's no real, like, big. I'm not seeing no big, like, like when the plays he be making in practice. When yeah, like, so it's nothing new. It's like, bro, I seen, bro, I've been seen. Like, bro, duh. Bro. I've seen, but it's like, I'm gonna be happier. When everybody else get to see it, oh man! When everybody else get to see it, I already know. Check your pulse, baby. Who's been? You know, I'm bringing like, this back one so more I'm time. Just, I'm just excited for for that for it, not even for me, but for him. Like for him, bro. Like you, people don't be understanding, bro. Sometimes, bro. Like I just like to see other people happy, bro. Right. Oh, I swear, I ain't nothing like seeing somebody else happy, bro. Especially yeah. like he good. Man, dude. he's a good dude too, though. Like one of the nicest people you'll meet. Right. Yeah, okay, we just jumped to 410 uh, viewers, 415. We're going to play this back so y'all see what I'm wilding out about. Bro, y'all need to listen to this right now. Scary hours are upon South Beach. Let's go. I'm going to troll people. Wait. <laughs> Me and J-Dub going cre- to create Twitter, fake Twitter accounts. It'd be so much I'd be one to say. Right. All right. How do, y- how do y'all deal with that? Like, how do you deal with that? Like, you see it. I think it's Y'all at practice. But you don't want to speak on it like you said. It, it, it remains to be seen. Y'all just going to let y'all uh, on the field play show. Bro, it's just like a horror movie, bro. It's just like suspense, bro. You got to you gotta get that build up, you know, just like all of the clips they've been releasing and stuff like that. You just can't show it all, right, you know? Right. Mm. Like, that's why I really believe they, like, showed that clip of Tua under throwing me, you know, mm. just to get people talking because they really know what Tua are capable of, for real. Like, there's a Ooh. plan behind everything, bro. Right. That's the way I Look at this man is telling you they strategically put out him under throwing to get people talking and they know what they're doing. They are lowering the expectations of everyone in the NFL so they can hit him over the side of the head. Man. I look at it. I don't know. What's your name, Jalen? They got a plan. They're trying to bury the man. I ain't going to lie. That boy looks scared right now. He's scared. That boy looks scared right now. Oh, wait, look. Answer this. And you ain't got to give us everything. To a last year, going into this year, how does he look? I'm not going to, not going to sugarcoat what's called it, bro. That's been, it's been him. Like he been that guy since Alabama. Since since Alabama, like he's been that guy. He's been the same guy. He's gonna come in consistent, accurate. He's gonna make the throws he's supposed to throw. And he's gonna show out, be a great leader. He's gonna be all that. Like so, it's no real. Like big, I'm not seeing no big like like when the plays he be making in practice. When yeah, like, so it's nothing new. It's like bro, I seen, bro. I've been seeing. Like bro. duh, I've seen. But it's like I'm gonna be happier when everybody else get to see it. Oh bro. man, when everybody else get to see what I already know who's been. Like so, I'm just I'm just excited for for that for it. Not even the for moves. me, but for him. Like, for him, bro. Like you, people don't be understanding, bro. Sometimes, bro, like I just like to see other people Tyreek happy, says, bro. Bro, more than me, I, I love it. I ain't nothing like seeing somebody else happy, bro. Especially yeah. like he good, man. Dude. He's a good dude too, though. Like one of the nicest people you'll meet, right? Like for real. Let's go. Oh man, you know, check your pulse, baby. Pulse check, pulse check, pulse check. I'm telling y'all. Jalen Waddle now got me. You got the goosies running through me right now. Shout out to King Z305. He's a perfect mentor for this guy. Bro, it ain't going to get any better for Jalen Waddle. And I keep, I've been saying the past couple weeks, everyone keeps talking about Tyreek. 
Don't sleep on that boy, Jalen. Don't sleep on that boy, Jalen. He's the best number two in the NFL. I don't care what anyone tries to tell me right now. Jalen Waddle is the best number two receiver in the NFL. He's better than T. Higgins. Someone out here really trying to tell me he's T. Higgins better than him? Stop it. Stop it. All right? He he's 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 an absolute stud. Absolute stud. I am so excited to watch that boy flourish this year. Man, we might have between the two of them, they might have put up 2,500 to 2,700 yards between the two of them. Because I'm going to tell you this right now. I think Tyreek is gunning for that 14 to 1,500 yard range to show everyone, hey, y'all thought Mahomes made me? Here, watch what I do with Tua. And then, you know, you got Waddle who in a off offense last year where he was bracketed, triangle coverage, box coverage, whatever, having to make a lot of tight window short short receptions just to get the ball in his hands, still put up over a thousand yards with no space, no one on one matchups, no opportunity at yards after the catch because there was no one else to respect in that offense. You're talking about Tyree could literally put up fourteen to fifteen hundred yards, and we could be talking about eleven to twelve hundred yards from Jalen Waddle. That is not a unrealistic possibility. And if that happens, man, if they get twenty five hundred yards between the two of them, let's just put that fourteen hundred for Tyreek, eleven hundred for Waddle. Let's just put it there, okay? All right, that's twenty five hundred yards. Gasecki, he's averaging six hundred to about. 850 yards, right? So let's go on the low form. Let's put him at 600 yards, even though we know he's going to do better. So he's at 600 yards. We're at 3,100 yards right now. Chase Edmonds is going to be good for three or 400 yards out of the backfield as a receiver. Let's go to the low end. Now we're at 3,400 yards. We haven't discussed Raheem Mozart, Sony Michelle, Durham Smythe, who's going to be good for another couple hundred yards. We haven't discussed Lynn Bowden. We haven't discussed Preston Williams if he's going to be used. You see where I'm getting at here? You see where I'm going? Think about it. Between if Waddle and Tyreek flirt with, you know, 2,500 yards between the two of them, Gasecki's another 600, which is a really low spectrum for Gasecki in this offense. I'm shortchanging. The guy could put up 800, nine. The guy could flirt with 900 easily in this offense. All right? So I'll put him on the low end at 600. That's 3,100 yards between just three players. That's Mozart and Chase Edmonds haven't been accounted for yet. Bowden hasn't been accounted for yet. Eric Zucama, who's going to get targets, hasn't been accounted for yet. Durham Smythe and Hunter Long, who are going to get targets, haven't been accounted for yet. You see where I'm going? If Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle produce what they're capable of producing together, their 4,000 yards should be easy. That's it. If these men, if 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 Tua does his job with Waddle and Tyreek, his numbers are going to be through the roof this year. I mean, really think about this for a second, okay? I want you to really think about this for a sec. So, 17 games in a season we're now, all right? If Tua averages 250 yards a game, that's 4,250 yards this year. Now, if he's going to go ahead and average 225, that's about 3,825 yards. So we need him to average between 225 to 250 yards a game. And you look at our offense and you look at the weaponry, that's much more than feasible. It's not like we're sitting here asking him to throw for 300 yards a game. 250, 225 to 250. We're gravy. Right? And then 
you know what? Don't even give me two touchdowns a game. Go ahead and average one and a half touchdowns a game, and you're at 26. So, again, if you average between one and a half to two touchdowns a game, and I don't care how you get them through the air running, that's going to be 25 and a half to 34 touchdowns. It's really not with this offense. It's really not, you know, a tall, tall, inconceivable order to ask of Tua Tungvaloa. It's really not. What's going on, Eric? Hope you're good, man. Hope you're good, bro. This man's liking the new setup. Bro, I hope you're good, man. You said you're going through it. I hope you're going I hope you're good, man. I hope everything's good with you, my guy. So I mean we're on the verge of something special here, man. And speaking of um shout out to Mems Salanoa, he said big time. Um Alofo's big kahuna. Appreciate you, my guy. Ten dollar donation. Appreciate you, homie. Um, let's get into this though, all right? Um Aaron Wilson. Um he uh he had this to say regarding you know sticking on the Jalen Waddle topic here for a sec. Um he said Dolphins stand out Jalen Waddle eyes big second season encouraged by Tua Tungvaloa's development. Jalen Waddle boosted his connection with Miami Dolphins quarterback Tua Tungvaloa as the two former Alabama teammates reunited during the wide receiver's prolific rookie season. Their collaboration was successful as Waddle seamlessly transitioned to the NFL as an all-rookie NFL selection who set an NFL rookie record with 104 receptions for a franchise record 1,015 receiving yards to go with seven touchdowns. Tungvaloa, one of the more scrutinized quarterbacks in the NFL, has drawn heavy praise this offseason from Waddle fellow receiver Tyreek Hill, and new coach Mike McDaniel. Waddle, who has set his ambitions for a big NFL season, second NFL season, is convinced the arrow is pointing up for the Dolphins and Tungvaloa, who went 7-5 and five as a starter last season, completed 67.8% of his throws for 2,653 yards, 16 touchdowns, and 10 picks for a 90.1 passer rating. The chemistry between Tungvaloa and Waddle is expected to continue to improve during the NFL their second season together. Two is great, Waddle said Saturday during a youth football camp hosted by Dolphins corner Xavier Howard. I think a great leader, real confident, got a lot of swag to him. Two is going to be all right. Joined by Hill following an offseason trade from the Kansas City Chiefs, Waddle drafted sixth overall last season, averaged 9.8 yards per reception. The Houston native is looking to increase his yards after the catch in his second NFL season. When well, you will, my friend, you're going to have the space. I'm just going to stay going to say to play consistent in and out every week, continue to make plays and just try to play my game week in and week out. Waddle said, I think my coaching staff, my teammates put a lot of confidence in me throughout the week that definitely went into Sundays and made Sundays a lot better. The Dolphins players under McDaniel as a replacement for former coach Brian Flores are encouraged by the outlook for the AFC East franchise. The Dolphins won nine and eight last season and didn't qualify for the playoffs. They finished 25th in total offense and 17th in passing offense. Remember, I can bring up numbers. I can bring up the receipts and show you how bad we were, right? Like when you look at as a passing offense and passing yards per game and a first down offense, we were awful under Brissett. Under Tua, we jumped up to middle of the pack as an passing offense, right? We jumped into a top 10 um, third down offense for a while there, you know, Waddle himself, he went up from averaging about 43 yards per game to over 70 yards a game when Tua came back. So it was significant across the board, the increase in production offensively from, from Brissett to Tua. All right. So what's it like to be out here supporting Xavier's camp and, uh, see him do his thing here? At um, I think it's always a good thing. You know, I'm out here supporting my teammates, supporting kids around, you know, the Houston area, um, area that I, you know, grew up in. So it's always great. So there's some talent out here. We're seeing some fast young people. Uh, uh, yeah. They got some, they got some burners out here getting in and out. They could. So got some guys. To think about where you guys are, 
you pretty excited about everything with the new coaching staff and everything that's going on with the Dolphins? Um, yeah, I think this is, you know, a uh, good time. we got some new players. I think everybody that uh, came in are great guys. And, uh, I think help us where we want to go. I saw a lot of the videos. It looked like Tua had a good spring. Uh, what's it like playing with Tua? Uh, Tua is great. Uh, I think a great leader. Um, real confident. Um, got got um, a lot of swag. So Tua's going to be over there. Big goals for you for the year. What are some things you'd like to get done uh, individually as part of the team concept? Uh... I'm just going to say uh, just playing consistent in and out um, every week, you know, continue to um, make plays um, and just try to, you know, play my game week in and week out. I mean, you had a, an excellent rookie season and you're coming off an injury. What made you feel so comfortable that you were able to produce right away? Uh, I think my my coaching staff, my teammates, you know, I think feeling confidence in me throughout the week. But, um, definitely went into Sundays and made Sundays a lot better. There's a lot of talent that comes out of the Houston area. What are some of the guys that, that you're seeing, kind of in your general age group, that have been doing well, just like you are? Um, it, it's a lot. We got um, X, of course, come, coming out. Um, I don't know. Houston got a lot of guys um, coming out. I can't. I can't really think of none at the top of my head, but Houston definitely represents. Um, a lot of scout reports, I see a lot of guys that's from the area, so it's always great. It's good to see, you know, the guys that you're competing with in high school are the same guys you're competing with in the league, right? Exactly. All right. Honestly, it's so weird now that he doesn't have the dreads. So weird. Um, besides hiring McDaniel and trading for Hill, they signed veteran offensive tackle Taron Arm said as a free agent, inked Howard to a contract extension, retained pass rusher Emmanuel Logba, and franchise tag tight end Mike Kosicki. Additionally, Miami signed quarterback Teddy Bridgewater to back up Tungvaloa, who has a history of injuries, and signed experienced running back Sony Michelle, Chase Edmonds, Raheem Mozart. I think it's a good time, Waddle said. We got some new players, everybody that came in are great guys. And I think that'll help us to get where we want to go. So the message is pretty consistent. I mean, even Tua's own receivers are expecting him to take that step forward this year. They're expecting a nice little leap from him. So they like the work that they've seen from him. And, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot of reason to be excited right now, you know, heading into this season, man. Don't let people try and, and say, oh, you're just getting your hopes up. And I, I told y'all when we hired Mike McDaniel, I'll stick to it. This feels a whole hell of a lot different. It feels a lot, lot different. All right. Um, speaking of, you know, when I spoke of Higgins and all that, um, CBS Sports, um, and specifically Brian McFadden from CBS Sports, they put this out today on the CBS Sports headquarters uh, Twitter. And uh, they had the Dolphins duo ranked number three in the NFL. Number three. Um, listen, Hill is better than Chase and Edmonds. Um, Waddle is better than Higgins. Um, and I think he's right there with Godwin. Um, I think it's us or the Bucks, And then I think the Bengals are at three. And then it's us or the Bucks at one. Right? Um, and I also think Minnesota, it's time to call Jefferson the number one and Thielen the number two because Jefferson is better than Thielen. Um, so personally, I think if you put a gun to my head, I think we do have the best receiving combo in the NFL, right? Um, I think Godwin and Evans would be number two. I think Chase and Higgins would be number three. I would I would actually um, put Renfro and Adams at four, and then I would put Jefferson and Thielen at five. Now, if it was Thielen from three, four years ago, I would stick them at four, but Thielen hasn't been the same guy. Everyone knows how I feel about Renfro, and Devontae Adams is a beast. I think him and Hill are the best receivers in the NFL. So let me know what you guys think. Do you think Tyreek Hill and Jalen Water are the best duo in the NFL? Because, I mean, you look at it. I'm going to tell you right now. Hill's better than Jamar Chase. Waddle's better than T. Higgins. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I think you got a better argument with Evans and Godwin, but I think Tyreek Hill's better than Evans. And I think Waddle and Godwin, you know, 
those are your arguments for best number two in in the league if you want to consider Godwin a number two behind Evans. And if you want to put Evans as a number two, then I like Waddle better than Evans. So who's your best? Who do you think ranks as the best wide receiver duo in the NFL right now? Let me know. Um, RG3 was on Rich Eisen. And this is what RG3 actually um, had to say. Let's play that clip for y'all. A tweet that you put out um, uh, a few days ago that you believe because of the way that the Dolphins have retooled um, their team in a way and added the cheetah, Tyreek Hill, that two is going to take a big leap this year. What makes you think that, Robert? Yeah, but, you know, Tua really hasn't had an opportunity to truly go out and show the NFL world who he is. Last year, he was, you know, throwing the ball in the pocket behind the 32nd ranked pass block unit in the league. Um, it seemed like at times the coaching staff wasn't truly sold on him, you know, whether it was bringing in Ryan Fitzpatrick or seeming like they wouldn't let him, you know, push the ball down the field, even though, like I said before, it just seemed like he just didn't have the time to do so. But two is an accurate quarterback, so when you bring him in and you bring in Tyree Kill, you already have Jalen Waddle there. You bring in Cedric Wilson from the Cowboys. Uh, Mike Gasicki there is a great tight end who can stretch the field. And then I think they did a, a really nice job of bringing in Teron Armstead. I agree, Eric. The Saints, and then Connor Williams, who sure. did struggle a little Agreed. bit last year, but it's still an upgrade for them at the center position agree, there Eric. on that offensive line. Uh, I just think that they put so many weapons around Tua and they brought in an offensive-minded head coach in Mike McDaniel that he, Tua's got one of two options, right? He's either going to prove that he's the guy this year Sink or, or swim, he's going to prove that they need to draft a quarterback next year. So yeah, I'm we'll on the side it. of I think they'll take a big leap because I don't think he has a choice with all the weapons that they brought in for him. Uh, and I know I'm missing leaving out some guys. You know, Lynn Bowden Jr. has got a chance to be a little bit of like a yeah. – I love Robert. Samuel Light RG3 naming Bowden. I love uh, it. It's a draft pick that people aren't really paying attention to. Yep. But he's a phenomenal wide receiver. Go check my Eric is a comma prospect uh, Last preview. year uh, at yep. Texas Tech. So I think that they just have so many weapons, and Tua's going to find a way to show uh, the grit that I've seen from him this offseason. You know, he's been a little, little testy with the media, uh, you know, getting upset about some of the stuff Let's that's being said, and I think that's good for him. Well, I mean, what does it look like? What does success look like for – for Tua, but what does the big leap look like? I mean, numbers wise and uh, wins wise, what do you what, what does that look like for you, Robert? Yeah, I know. You know, everyone wants to wants to go to numbers and wins. Yes, like last year, Tua had, yes. Yeah, Tua had sixteen touchdowns and ten picks. I think if he goes if he goes twenty five touchdowns, seven interceptions, I think that's a great year uh, for Tua. The, the the benefit that Tua has that a lot of other quarterbacks don't is there's no expectation for a Super Bowl this year for the Dolphins, right? Every team is, is going out there and they're putting everything they can uh, out on the field um, to, to win a Super Bowl, but the Dolphins don't really have that expectation. It's not the same as Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson or Tom Brady. So Tua doesn't have to get the Dolphins to the playoffs. They don't have to win the Super Bowl for it to be a successful year for him because that's what we're really talking about here. For him, he just has to show that he can be a franchise quarterback. Do I think? That Tua can take that big leap and include a playoff uh, berth? Yes, I do. With this roster, uh, the way their defense played last year, yes, I think he can do that. Does he absolutely need that to happen for it to, it, to, to be a big leap for him? No. Um, I think if he just shows that he, can, he is that guy, I think the Dolphins will be very happy with him. Well, that's a very nuanced take, and I greatly appreciate it because that's what I'm all about, too. But right now, Robert, you and I are in the mosh pit of Sports Talk Radio. So um, let's get right down to it. Chris, ask him the uh, the what's more likely scenario <laughs> that you asked of me sure. two, two weeks ago. We have this uh, uh, Friday segment where Chris comes up with some scenarios here about what is more likely, A or B. Ask uh, Robert Griffin the third. Yeah, just uh, very silly, Robert. Okay, so what's more likely that Tua has 30 combined touchdowns, running, okay, running scoring, and, and throwing, scoring, yep. or he struggles and Tom Brady is a Dolphins quarterback in 23? 
Uh, it's more likely that Tua has 30 combined touchdowns. There you go. Let's go, RG3. Welcome to 2 and Robert. Welcome to 2 and I don't think Brady goes to the Dolphins. I know there's all, all the stories about that, <laughs> but I think now Brady's in Tampa Bay. He's, he's either going to win there or he'll be done. I don't think he's playing for another team. Let's go. Love it. Um, hey, man. Let's do it, you know. 25 touchdowns, seven interceptions. Was that was our was that I think it was with the baseline numbers RG3 gave. I know there's a number, some numbers I heard someone give today. 25 touchdowns and seven interceptions. I'm pretty sure it was RG3. Um, you know, I'd be I'd be happy with that, but I think we can flirt with 30 here. You know, I'm looking for this is what I'm looking for. I'm, I've told y'all before. Reasons, expectations. Here we go. I'm gonna lay it out for y'all. I need 3,800 to 4,200 yards. I need 28 to 32 touchdowns. Now, if you get 27 or 26, I'm not going to cry. But I need 28 to 32 combined touchdowns. All right? And I want you to be 8 to 12 interceptions. That's acceptable for me. Right? 3,800 to 4,200 yards. Then I need 28 to 32 touchdowns. And then on top of that, I need 8 to 12 interceptions. I mean, if this guy goes high end on everything, including, I mean, 8 would be the high end on interceptions, right? Because you want the lowest. So that'd be the best possible result. But if he gets best possible, 4,200 yards, 32 touchdowns, and 8 interceptions, that's flirting with MVP numbers. So that's what I need. I can take 3,900 yards, 28 touchdowns, and 10 picks. We're rolling if that's happening. That's what I need. If he provides in those areas, if he lands in that, let's go. Let's go. And stay healthy. Now, the reason why reason don't harp on to his injuries, and this is why. That's an answer we're going to get this year. You go back to year one when he was held out against the Jets that Fitz had to play, and he had the finger injury. And remember, the reports were he wanted to get back in there he wanted to play, but they didn't let him. I don't know how many games I've been told when he could have played or whatever, like especially last year. I don't know how many games he was truly held out of that he could have played. So I don't know if this injury thing's, you know, is it worse because Flores was trying to prove a point and get his boy Jacoby the job? That's what that's the impression I come away with. That he hasn't been as soft at the NFL level as he's made out to be, that was part of the, Hey, this guy can't hack it. We got to move off of him and go get me to Sean Watson angle. Flores was playing clearly. Um, bleach report. They came out with an article and, um, they said they, they went off of the biggest winners and losers of the 2022 NFL offseason. They said the NFL offseason presents every team with opportunities to get better, but the league is ultimately a zero-sum game. There are those who get better and those who get worse. The 2022 offseason was one of the wildest in recent memory. Several stars were traded, huge contracts were handed out, and the coaching carousel saw nearly a third of the league put a new man in charge. While everyone can find some reason to be optimistic, there are inevitably winners and losers of the offseason. Those winners came out in much better situations when they started. The losers, well, this offseason hasn't quite worked out for them. So, obviously, they start off with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as a winner. Um, but they got the Cleveland Browns as a loser for acquiring Deshaun Watson. So, that's got to suck for all of you that were pushing really hard for that, huh? Get labeled a loser. Uh, the Jets labeled a winner. I agree. They are definitely, I think they're going to be better. If they get a quarterback, they'll be better than the Patriots. Uh, Baker Mayfield and Jimmy G is losers. The Denver Broncos were considered winners. Uh, Justin Fields considered a loser because they didn't really upgrade for him. Winner, Los Angeles Chargers. I mean, we got to talk about what they've added, you know. Loser, Arizona Cardinals. I think. I personally think it's going to be over for Kingsbury after this season. And for the Dolphins, they had Mike McDaniel as a winner. 
Mike McDaniel, baby. The NFL coaching carousel was in hyperdrive this offseason, and when the dust settled, Mike McDaniel had become one of the biggest winners. The 39-year-old had just one year as the 49ers offensive coordinator under his belt, came away with one of the best jobs that was available. He'll get to take the reins of a Miami team that went 9-8 and eight last season. That was before the Dolphins brought in a bunch of new offensive weapons. They added a ton of speed and playmaking ability by acquiring Tyree Kill from the Chiefs and signing Cedric Wilson Jr., Raheem Moser, Chase Edmonds, and Sony Michelle. Most importantly, they added competency on the NFL on the offensive line with tackle Taron Armstead and card Connor Williams. What do I always say? Give me competency. And we got much more competency with those two. McDaniel will also enter the 2022 season with a defense that was in the top half of the league in yards allowed per play and should be better this year. Even if things don't go well in McDaniel's first season, it's likely that Tua Tungvaloa will get the lion's shoulder of the blame after struggling through his first two campaigns. 24-year-old now has everything in place to prove he can be the franchise's quarterback. But if McDaniel can guide the Dolphins to their first playoff burst since 2016, he'll be hailed as a genius. It's good to be McDaniel right now. And that's why I started off the show and I talked about expectations. This goes back to what I'm talking about, right? Look at it. They told you what I've told you from gate one. Everyone, people tried to sell you guys. I heard people saying on platforms. I heard people saying on Twitter, on YouTube, Twitter, that, oh, if, if they if they drop the ball and they fall on their face, McDaniel will get fired. No, 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 no. What have I said since day one? I have said there's two things since day one I've said about McDaniel and if things go bad this year. One, if the defense goes bad, he's going to turn and point to Boyer and he's going to say, listen, I gave you the exact same defense you had last year. Uh, you know, we upgraded the staff by bringing in Sertain and Madison. I gave you Channing Tindall, right? I gave you my first ever pick as a head coach. I did everything I could for you, and you dropped the ball. Now, then he'll turn to management and say, now let me go get a guy I trust. So that'll be Boyer. And if if the offense flutters, and Tua specifically, this is what I've told you all guys from day one. They have not attached to it to his hip. It is make him work. If he doesn't work, we've got the capital to move on and get you another guy, whether it's a vet or a draft pick next year. It's the same thing why, and I've said this before, I think Austin Jackson and Eichenberg have been forced on him. I don't think they let him move off those guys because of what they've invested in those guys so far in terms of time and draft picks. It's the same thing you want to use with Tua. They invested a number fifth, fifth, five overall pick with Tua. They invested number 18 in Jackson. They traded an extra third to move up and get Eichenberg in the second, uh, 42nd overall. I think they, they're the same way they're saying, hey, we see what you do with all these quarterbacks. Can you do that with Tua? Here's a year to do that with Tua. I think it's the same way with our offensive linemen. Hey, you brought in Frank Smith. You know what I mean? Who obviously has um, a pass with it. You brought in Embry. Um, you've brought in, obviously, Matt Applebaum. You've brought in a lot of good minds. Can you make those two guys work too? And if you can't, we'll move off of them this year. I think it's the same way. So that's why the expectations are high. But the pressure isn't actually on McDaniel. It's not on McDaniel. It's on everyone else but McDaniel, if you really think about it. Now, obviously, the expectations are there for him to perform. But as a, if he goes 1-15 and 15 or, uh, sorry, 1-16 and 16 or 0-17, okay, he'll get fired. But the expectations, he doesn't have lofty expectations like Tua does. He doesn't have lofty expectations like Jackson and Eichenberg do. He doesn't have lofty expectations like Tyreek Hill does on a $30 million contract or Gusecki does on a franchise tag. He doesn't have lofty expectations of Boyer. Prove you can be that guy without Flores. You know, you can sit there and name a lot more people that they're going to be out the door and they're going to have fingers pointed at them before Mike McDaniel does if this season goes wrong. So... Totally different than last year. Because remember what I told you last year. If we if, if we fall on our face, everyone's going to turn on Flores and he's done. And what happened? I'm going to tell you right now, if we fall on our face, Mike McDaniel is well down the pecking order of finger pointing. I'm going to tell you that right now. So 
So, and he's been put in a position to succeed like no other first-time head coach, at least in Miami, has been. Not many first-time head coaches get the opportunity he has. It kind of, you know, it kind of reminds you of. It kind of reminds you of when Eric Spolster in Miami got the opportunity to be the first-time head coach with LeBron and all and Bosch and Wade and Pat Riley told those guys, hey, listen to him. He's going to take you there. And look at what Spolstra has turned into since then. It kind of reminds you of that, right? Like, look at Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell. Look at the stars he's adopting over here as a first-time head coach. The Eric Spolstra and Mike McDaniel similarities are there and how they were brought in situationally, very, very similar, but... Let's see. If, uh, hopefully they play out the same way. Please give us some championships. Good God. I'm a grown man begging on YouTube. Please give us some championships. All right. Um, let's, uh, let's get into um, things casual football fans say. And there's a specific group that are up here. So... They're calling you casual, not me. And this is courtesy of via NFL polls now. Things casual fans say. Lamar's a running back. Michael Thomas can only run slants. Tua is already a bust. Oh, all the way down there for another sect of Dolphin fans. The Watson trade was smart. So there's <laughs> we we got we got well, it's one sect, but y'all, they hit one sect of Dolphin fans twice over. How does that feel? Shots fired. Pa, 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 pa. By NFL polls now. I mean, I'm telling you, we've been telling you. Anyone calling to a bust, they are most definitely jumping the gun. Right? So... Shout out to NFL polls now for setting one sect of Dolphin fans in their place <laughs> twice over in one. Oh man, oh, how do y'all feel, man? They only had eight slots, and they did de literally dedicated twenty five percent of those eight slots to one sect of our fan base. Oh my god, love it, love it. <laughs> oh my god, and y'all just saw Bleacher Report called labeled the Browns as a loser. Forgetting the Watson. Well, we'll see how it all plays out. I still think they're going to try and push for a year. I, I I don't see him. I don't know if they're going to. They're going to try and suspend him indefinitely. I think he's going to appeal it down to like eight games or 12 games. But good luck with Jacoby Brissett for that many games. We already know what that is. Anyways. Y'all casuals now. If I hear anyone calling two is already a bust, I'm calling you a casual. I have a right to now. And then finally, Pro Football Talk is still spewing utter nonsense. They said which teams should be thinking about making a run of Baker Mayfield. For weeks, two teams have been linked to the Browns quarterback, Baker Mayfield, the Panthers, and the Seahawks. And I don't know if you saw it today, but Ian Rappaport, he came out and said he's hearing the Seahawks aren't in on Baker Mayfield. With all teams in position to study film from offseason workouts with plenty of teams perhaps not having clear answers at the position, which teams should be at least pondering the possibility of a potential upgrade from the current projected starter to Mayfield? On this weekend featuring not much actual news, now is a good time as any to try and identify the universe of teams that should be at least thinking about Mayfield. Here they are in no order. The Browns, um, and that's because if Watson gets hit. The Steelers, because of Pickett. Um, the Panthers, obviously reasons the Falcons, because he's a bet. He is a better option than Marcus Mariota. I agree with the Falcons and I agree with the Steelers. I think, I don't think Kenny Pickett's going to be shit. And I agree with the Browns. They fucked themselves. Um, the Panthers too, the Seahawks. I mean, I was a Drew Locke fan coming out, but he might be, I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't hurt having him in that competition. The Saints, um, no, I'd roll with Jameis Winston see what he can do in another year. So I don't agree with that. The Lions, eh, I wouldn't hook to him. Roll with Jared Goff. See if he's the guy. If he isn't, move off of him, and they're going to have a good pick next year. The Giants, now, I'm going to be honest with you. 
you know, we've seen four years of Daniel Jones going to his fifth year. I'm taking Baker Mayfield over Daniel Jones every day of the week. Sorry. I, I, I was not a fan of Daniel Jones coming out. I hate Daniel Jones to this day still. The Texans, I don't agree with this. Um, you roll with Davis Mills after what he showed you last year. That is not a, you lo- another year under Pep Hamilton. No, you roll with Davis Mills. The 49ers, no, you roll with Trey Lance if you're not going with Jimmy G. Nope, don't agree with that. And then they got the Dolphins, and this is what they said about the Dolphins. And look at it. Goes, the, the, they said, I know I said I'd list teams in no particular order, but I saved this one for last. Two and on won't like this one bit, but let's be fair. Mayfield, when healthy, can do much more than Tua has ever done. And with Mike McDaniel drawing up the plays, Mayfield could be exactly what the Dolphins need to to with, to hit their full potential in 22, 2022 and beyond. If they can get them for cheap, they definitely should consider it, even if they won't. I don't agree with that. Same reason of Trey Lance. Same reason of Davis Mills. Nope. You've upgraded. You can. We haven't had a chance to gauge what Tua's ceiling is. We've had a chance to gauge what Baker Mayfield's ceiling is in the NFL. Let's see what Tua can do. Now, if people, it's on record. It's on receipt. I said from the f- moment, and I remember the pushback from EM and everyone, and it's on TD Finn's talk, and it's on this channel. I said, OBJ was the worst thing that was going to happen to that team. Baker Mayfield came like a bat out of hell, right? Set the passing touchdown record, which was obviously then beat by Herbert, and he did, and he didn't even play a full season, so he probably would have beat Herbert's numbers. He would have played the full season, but he came out and was showing off. And I said, the moment that OBJ went there, I said, this is the worst for Mayfield. You know why? Because Mayfield, so because OBJ is a type of presence where instead of developing and getting better at rolling through his progressions, he's going to get it locked in his head because OBJ is a ball hog throw to OBJ if he looks even an inch open. Even if he's an inch open. Jarvis Landry's game suffered. I mean, go look at Jarvis Landry the year before they got OBJ. They got OBJ because they were on a trajectory upwards and they thought he'd put him over the top when really he made the situation worse. He stunted Mayfield. You know, OBJ is a type of receiver, and I've said this. This is why he worked with Eli Manning. Eli Manning had been in the league when OBJ came around. He knew how to handle OBJ. OBJ is not the type of personality or receiver you give to a young quarterback. It's why Stafford can make it work with him last year. He needs to go with a veteran who's got a resume and can tell him, shut up. You will get the ball when I roll, if you're open, when I go through my progressions. Not with a young kid trying to learn his way, and he's going to feel peer pressure and force to overlook and overthrow that way. It just happens. And then look at they made that playoff run, not this year, but last year. And what happened? OBJ got injured and they made the playoff run without OBJ. Thus proving my point even further that OBJ stunted them. Anyways, going back to this. No. Tua is the guy for this year. If he is not this year, you look at trying to get one of the top guys in next year's draft. Or if a veteran hits the market and one will. You make a move. And I say that because, listen, did everyone think that Tom Brady would get traded to Tampa, uh, sorry, would leave New England and go to Tampa Bay? Did anyone think Stafford would finally get traded by the Lions, especially after how they would never trade Sanders when he wanted out and they traded him to the Rams? to go get. Did anyone think that this Lamar Jackson drama would be going on right now? Did, what if the, the Arizona Cardinals fall flat on their face and Kyler is going to become available and they don't want to pay him? There's going to be options if if y- you can't afford to move up in the draft. There's going to be tons of options. But I'm going to say this. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I don't think we're going to have to worry about it. I think two is going to enter the realm of top 12 quarterbacks in the NFL this year. I truly believe that. I thought he was going to take a Good third-year leap as it was before we signed Taron Armstead, Connor Williams, Cedric Wilson, and Tyreek Hill. Now that we've added those pieces and our coaching staff has been laid out the way it is, I still say Daryl Bevel is one of the best off-season acquisitions of any team. I think two is going to take that leap, and it's going to be even bigger than what I originally thought. Again, 3,800 to 4,200 yards is my expectation. 28 to 32 touchdowns and 8 to 12 interceptions. 
All right. And I think, you know, he's going to flirt with a 70% completion percentage and his, his passer rating is going to go up. His quarterback rating is going to go up from the 90.1. It was last year and it might get near a hundred. So I, I got big expectations for two of this is year three. Let's get it. And you see our receivers are hyped. It's scary hours in Miami, baby. It's scary hours. All right, guys, I'm going to be back tomorrow night, and we are going to specifically take a look at the best position battles heading into training camp because it's going to be a dog fight for some of those spots. So I'll see you all tomorrow. As always, stay happy, healthy, safe, and blessed. And you already know what time it is. Fins up, baby, all day.